There is an ancient book that remains a mystery to most of the Earth's inhabitants. It tells us why we are here, reveals the mysteries of heaven and the horrors of hell, and the hero is God himself in our Lord Jesus Christ. Learn of the Ancient of Days by listening to Bible Believers Fellowship Saturdays at noon and Sundays at 9.30 p.m. on 91.5 Freedom FM. Welcome to Bible Believers Fellowship and the ministry of KJVBibleBelievers.com. On this program, we begin our two-part study titled, The Dragon, Seven Heads, and Ten Horns. Our text is Revelation chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Let's start off with verses 1 and 2. Read that with me. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she, being with child, traveling in birth, and pained to be delivered. Did I, did I read that wrong? Let's try it again. And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth, and pained to be delivered. Now, we studied this in our previous study and saw that this woman is Israel. And if you did not get to see that or hear that, you need to make sure you catch that. We're not going to reteach it this week. But this woman is Israel. Genesis 37, 9 is the reference. You can read and compare with that, and it's pretty clear. So we move on to verse 3. And re go ahead and read that with me. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon. Now stop. That is the kind of thing that causes a lot of people to say, there's no way anybody can understand the book of Revelation. And that's how they say it. They sound like that. There's no way. And as we said last week, when you see this woman with the stars, a crown of stars, and she's clothed with the sun and the moon at her feet, that looks wild to the, uh, the person who's unfamiliar with the Word of God. But we showed last week that if you read from Genesis to Revelation, you'll see how it all fits together. And the same thing's true when it comes to reading about this other wonder in heaven and a great red dragon. You, you ask the question, who is this red dragon? And the answer is, in the book. And in particular, we're actually going to see that the book of Revelation answers that question, but it doesn't answer it until after this verse. So a lot of times when you're studying a book and you're studying the book of Revelation, you have to say, okay, I don't get that. Let's make a note there and keep reading. Sometimes we've seen that the very next verse defines what the verse you're questioning means. But in this case, it's actually a little later on. Flip in your Bible there to Revelation 20. From Revelation 12 to Revelation 20. And you ask the question, who or what is this dragon? And I used to have a t-shirt with this on it. And uh, used to really, I wish I could find it again because it really instigated a lot of conversation. And uh, verse 2 of Revelation 20, read that with me. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. Now, I don't know about you, that's, that's clear enough I understood it. <laughs> I mean, how can you miss that? Who's the dragon? What is the dragon? It's that old serpent, which is... And if he stopped there, people said, well, I don't think the serpent is a reference to Satan. I think the serpent represents the kundalini. And then, you know, that's where people would go with it. But he keeps going that it's not just that old serpent, it's specifically the devil. Well, that could be just in a symbolic sense of the evil of the world. Okay. No, no, he keeps going. He says, and Satan. Amen. And now if you don't get it, just get out. Because <laughs> you're hopeless. Go color, get some crayons. And, and we're not going to get into all the rest of it. It says it and, and bound him a thousand years. We're going to see what that's all about later on to be continued. Amen? But you notice it didn't just call him a dragon. It specifies he's a great red dragon. So that means he's Chinese, right? 
No. I'm not joking. That's what people teach. Yeah. And then some people say sunburn. I'm kidding. That's it. I made that up. But the one about being Chinese, that's true. People teach that. So you ask the question, why does it say red dragon? Again, where's the answer? The book. Where is the answer? Hold up your book. You got a book? How many of you got one? How many? I believe that... The, no, I'm just kidding. That's, you seen Joel Osteen do that? Does he still do that? Yes. You watch him, don't you? See? That's how I, I got it. I, got, I know where you... I know where you get. All right. So what's red represent in the Bible? Well, we're going to see it represents sin. It represents blood. It represents death. All right? Turn to Isaiah. I'm going to give you a second to turn there because this is a verse you ought to mark in your Bible if, you, if it's not already marked there. Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah chapter 1. We're going to ask the question, why is he called the great red dragon? Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18. Read that with me. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Now if you just look at that verse, what's the red connected to? Sin. And it gives two colors of two shades of red. Why? Because blood can be more a little more scarlet and in other people it's a little more red. Blood is not always the same color, but it's always a red. That's why you you can look up this uh and if you put an equal sign right there, <laughs> it means something. But uh, scarlet and crimson, these are the two different shades of red that it mentions there. And when you see the color red in the Bible, I mean, we see the color scarlet and we think of the Buckeyes. Amen. Amen. I've got some weird, I got some very strange friends that see this and they think of Alabama. <laughs> you, know, you know, I don't know how that works. But to a Christian who's a Buckeye fan, even, when you're reading the Bible, you see the scarlet and the crimson, you think of red, and you think that red stands for sin because sin brings death. Amen? For the wages of sin is death. And so every time you see red in the Bible, you think of sin and death, except that the reason you see sin and death is because the Bible says that's the color red, scarlet and crimson, but the Bible also says that the life is in the blood. So in order for Jesus to die for your sins, regardless of what people like John MacArthur say, He shed His blood... He had to shed His blood and die. And so when some teacher tells you, well, we have to stop short from saying that we're saved by the blood, that teacher's a heretic. The blood was shed by Jesus because the life is in the blood. And that red blood speaks of sin and death. Now look at John 8, 44. John MacArthur is who I was referring to, but other people teach it. He's on your radio stations. Most of the radio Christian radio stations carry him. John 8, 44. Sin, death, and the dragon. It's all mixed together. The red dragon. Satan. Also called him the serpent, but it called him the devil. Amen? Amen. Well, look at John 8, 44. And the first part of that verse says, Ye are of your father, the devil. Now that's Jesus speaking. Read it again. Ye are of your father the devil. Stop there. Jesus wasn't always sweet and cuddly. Do you notice that? There was a time where Jesus talked directly against people who were corrupt. He rebuked people. Just want you to notice that. And he continues and he says, And the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer.
from the beginning. You see the connection there of sin mm -hmm. and the dragon, the great red dragon, and death. Look at John 10. Just turn over a page or two there. John 10, 10. John 10, verse 10. The verse starts out. Read it with me. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. That's the great red dragon right there. He has come to kill and to steal and to destroy. That's what he's all about. So the rest of verse 3 says, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. So we got to put all this together now. You got the woman that we talked about. And now you have this red dragon. And the red represents death and sin. And this red dragon, who is the devil, has seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. Now that's, a, I think, a better drawing than I've seen anybody else do on this seven-headed, ten-horned creature. Because he ain't pretty. And uh, sometimes you hear the expression, uh, uh, you can actually see red. Mm -hmm. see, that's right. But well, that's what it means. It says you uh, caught him red handed. I mean, it's like he's killed somebody and he has blood on his hands. That's what that means. Yeah. That's why Ezekiel talks about if you don't tell the wicked who's going in his way, if you don't warn him, then you have blood on your hands mm -hmm. because you as much as killed them. That's why if you, I've told you, we've said it, I'm glad you brought that up, Freddie, I get to go on a rant. Amen. That if you know somebody who is in sin and you don't lovingly confront them, you're going to have blood on your hands. I don't take that figuratively. You can take it however you want. I believe when we stand before the Lord, we're going to have blood on our hands if we don't warn those we love. I believe that. And... We talked about different groups, different people, but it doesn't matter what it is. If they're in rebellion against God, and especially if you know someone who's unsaved. If you know someone who's unsaved and you will not share the Gospel with them, shame on you. You're going to have blood on your hands. Now, these seven heads, I believe, are the continents. And the ten horns are the regions of global governance to be established very soon. I say that because it's already in the works. If you're not aware of this, you are a part of a government right now. Your government, the United States government, is already suspended the U.S. Constitution. The U.S. Constitution is only in effect for uh, practical purposes right now. And the United States government has already signed treaties with other countries and already given over about two-thirds of the property in this country to the United Nations. And if you don't know about it, it's called Agenda 21. Just go out and look it up. You're going to hear it from me in the future, but if you want to find out before I teach on it, look it up. Agenda 21. I should have, I should have brought the map. I have a map. And I've shown it before, months ago. But there's a map that shows, and speaking of red, ironically, the parts of the map in red are now under the control of the United Nations. And when you look at the American map and you see all those red spots, there's very little land left. It's being, and if you go to a lot of the, all the national parks and a lot of the state parks and you look closely, they put signs out and told you. They, put, they have signs out telling you that it now is a part of a protective biosphere. And it's protected land. And no one's allowed to do anything on it. And they're taking over your country, folks. The good old United States of America and the territories that are on that map have already been given over to a foreign power. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And the... The way it's working out is that there's basically going to be kind of like two areas that you will be under. And one is continental and the other is uh, basically ten regions. 
And so if you just think of that, the seven heads, they're going to be a power base and those are the heads that are said to have crowns. But here's what, it could work out any of a number of ways. I mean, we don't know exactly how this is going to work out. But we're going to come to more of that, so I don't want to jump ahead. But this is the ten regions that the Club of Rome, if you haven't heard of that, the Club of Rome has already broken up the world into ten regions, which would represent those ten horns. And right now, the ten regions are being established as units. And this over here is called the North American Union. And this right here is the South American Union. And then you have the uh, Central African Union. And they've got different labels for every one of those regions. And they are basically taking the model of the United States where 50, well at the time it was 13, individual states sovereign states came into a union. And just like those 13, now I'm going to tell you this and some of you Yankees are going to get mad at me and I don't care, it's a fact. The 13 original states came together in a voluntary union with the right of secession. Amen. And then later on when some states tried to secede, and no, I'm not pro-slavery. This that had nothing to do with what I'm... But it doesn't matter what it is, a state had a right to secede. But it was too late. And the federal government had already become too powerful. And when those southern states tried to secede, we had an invasion of the south by the north. Now that's what happened. And if you just read your history books and not be just open and you know, take whatever they say, if you read it for what really happened, that's what happened. And it's about to happen again. Because now these United States and Canada are already in a North American Union. And there is no out. And then they are going to join with a global union, which is already, the framework's already set up. And once you're in it, it's Hotel California, baby. You can check out any time you want, but you can never leave. And once the United States checks into this Ten Horn Union, That'll be the end of the United States completely. Done. And you will never get out of it until Jesus returns. And that's what's coming. And I hope and pray it happens after the rapture. But not necessarily, folks. The Bible does not say that the ten horns that we're reading about set up here will happen after the rapture. It doesn't say that. What we do know is that something's come later. And we'll go ahead and turn there. Daniel chapter 7 sometime after the rapture, there is going to be something happen. And that's why the dragon is pictured with seven heads and ten horns, is because it fits with the book of Daniel. And in Daniel chapter 7, which we've studied before, months ago, in uh, verses 23 and 24, it describes what's going to happen. Daniel chapter 7, verse 23 says, Thus he said, The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth which shall be diverse from all kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. This fourth kingdom, the kingdom of the beast, will be a global kingdom. It will be global. Now, there will be pockets of resistance, and it will then start to crumble. But at the very beginning, there's this global governance. Now, this is how it's pictured by NATO. Folks, that's who runs your country. Your, your military is not your military. If you serve in the military, you don't serve the United States of America. You serve NATO. And NATO has already broken up the world and is ruling the world militarily using this model. Now, it's hard to pick out without real... You've got to look real close, but you've got this area. You've got one, two, three, four, five basic... Uh, uh, North Atlantic Treaty Organization, the European Union, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, the UN, the Council of Europe, the Western European Union. And then from that, you look inside here and you see how they've broken them up into one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And so they have the ten regions broken up already and are already ruling militarily. It's already happening. 
Now, some of you may not have been aware of this, but that's the world you live in. The reason why you don't realize it is because, number one, if you watch the news, and you watch ABC, NBC, CBS, CNN, Fox, or any of the mainstream, mainstream mainline networks, they lie to you. They ain't going to tell you this. And I have, I have Christians all the time say, well, Fox News is the exception. No, Fox News ain't the exception. It's a Roman Catholic network. Amen. And it will, they will tell you exactly what the other stations will tell you, except in what we would call national politics, where they'll differ with the liberals on national issues. But on international issues, Rupert Murdoch is a globalist. Amen. Right. Roman Catholic globalist. Yep. Yep. And that's the truth. And if you're not aware of this, and it's because you don't care, then shame on you. Repent. Because God said you are not supposed to be ignorant. You are supposed to be the most well-informed person on the planet. You are a child of light, not a child of darkness. You are supposed to know what's going on around you. When Jesus came, He looked at the wicked Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Hellenists and those people out there saying, Crucify Him! And Jesus said, You fools! If you had known the time of your visitation, you wouldn't be killing your king right now. Amen. You don't have us. Go ahead. Yeah, amen. Yeah, tear us apart. Oh, Freddie. Oh, shut yourself. Freddie, Freddie I'm, I'm telling you the way John the Baptist would have told you, the way Jesus would have told you, and that is to tell you that if you are not paying attention to the world you're living in, then you are backslidden. Wake up. Wake up. Ye that slumber. How many times have you read that in the Bible? It's in there. Now look, verse 24. Read that with me. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall rise after them. And he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings. Now let me do the math. Look up here. I know some of you flunked math, but there it is. What's 10 minus 3? Seven. 7. Under how many? One. 1. That's where we're heading. This 10 region, 10 horn system that's already being set up is going to have one who will come and subdue three and he will then rule over the seven that remain. And that is taking place, if you look, if you'll open your eyes, taking place right in front of your eyes. And sadly, people don't understand this. That's the honest truth. Amen. The United Nations is satanic. That's right. If you go to the United Nations building in New York, you will find that they have a chapel. And in that chapel, you will find all the religions represented and the claim that they all lead to the same thing. You know what? They're not far off. Other than Bible-believing Christianity, all religions lead to hell. Amen. And all religions are going to lead everybody to worship the one that we had up here a minute ago. The one. And I'm not talking about Obama. He was the one to a bunch of dumb liberals in America. But there's coming one who will be the one for the world. And all paths will lead to Him. Now, I want you to turn to Psalm 1 in closing. Now, this is just one of the places that we can go to. And there are other places that we can read where you'll see this same thing. Psalm, I'm sorry, it's Psalm 2. Psalm 2. That concludes part one of our two-part study in Revelation chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, titled, The Dragon, Seven Heads and Ten Horns. Part two of this message, along with more than 200 additional messages in audio and video, can be found on our website at kjvbiblebelievers.com. 
We make all of our messages available for free download and for viewing and streaming video. That address again is kjvbiblebelievers.com. To send us a message, click the Contact Us button at kjvbiblebelievers.com and send us your letter. Or if you would rather write to us by U.S. Postal Service, send your letter to Bible Believers Fellowship, P.O. Box 662, Worthington, Ohio, 43085. That U.S. Postal address again is P.O. Box 662, Worthington, Ohio, 43085. Jesus is coming soon, and now is the day of salvation. On behalf of Bible Believers Fellowship, I am Pastor Greg, and we thank you for listening. That's why we read in 1 Corinthians 15. I want you to read that with me. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. And that just means unless you've just flippantly said, oh yeah, I believe. There have been many people have a preacher come to their door, knock on the door, and say, oh, say the sinner's prayer, and oh, okay, well, blah, 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 blah. And they don't mean it. Listen, folks, you know your heart. I don't. You know your mind. I don't. And no one else does. But if you have not been serious with God and really believed the gospel, you're on your way to hell. You have purposely put a wall of separation between you and God because you've not taken this seriously. But if you will take it seriously and really search your heart and say, I believe. I believe this Gospel. And what is the Gospel? Read verses 3 and 4 with me. Here it is. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. That's it. You seriously, before God, believe that He died for your sins and paid the full price. He rose from the dead and conquered sin and death. And by that alone, you have eternal life. The Bible says you are saved. But if not, then not. That's how simple it is. You know, religion stinks. Because religion muddies the waters. Religion makes you think that church membership or having a title or something like that is going to help you in dealing with your sin. Let me tell you something. You sinned against God, not the religious people, not the institutions who are giving you all these false promises. You sinned against God and what He says matters. And if you sinned against God, He is infinite. Your sin requires an infinite payment. That's why you can't work for it. You can work your entire life and do the best you can and it's still finite. You can never do enough works to pay for the cost of sin. And Jesus dying on the cross was an infinite payment for your sin. And that's why He's your only hope. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Visit the online ministry of Bible teacher and elder of Bible Believers Fellowship in Worthington, Ohio, Michael Kaler. Visit 2 Timothy 2-15.org. That's 2 Timothy 2-15.org.